One of the most interesting characters in the book of Joshua is Rahab. Do you know Rahab, who was a prostitute, who um, took care of the spies in Jericho, and then she and her family were uh, saved, even though Jericho was destroyed. Rahab is mentioned more often in the New Testament than even Joshua is. And the book of Hebrews talks about the fact that Rahab, though she was a prostitute, she showed faith. She was saved by faith, not by works. She was a prostitute. And that just shows that you're saved by grace and by faith, not by your good works or your pedigree. And one of the most fascinating things about Rahab is that she's actually in Jesus' genealogy. Hi, we are discovering the gospel in every single book of the Bible. Uh, as we say, it's really important to read through the Bible uh, once or twice, um, every couple of years. And yet, unless you know what's going on in a particular book, it's very difficult sometimes to make sense of the individual statements or stories or narratives or insights in the book. So what we're trying to do in this series is give you an overview of each book of the Bible. Uh, we're looking at each book and asking, what is it basically about? Um, how does it fit in with the overall storyline of the Bible? How does it move the storyline along? Thirdly, how does it point to the gospel of grace? And lastly, how does this book point to Jesus himself? So uh, let's talk about the book of Joshua. And Joshua is pretty easy to identify um, historically. It, it runs from the death of Moses to the death of Joshua. Joshua was the successor to Moses. And Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land to take it. And the, um, uh, the, key, the key driver here was uh, God's faithfulness to his promise. Let's talk about how this fits in with the storyline of the Bible. Uh, what, what comes out again and again in the book of Joshua, uh, and we've mentioned this in, the, uh, in previous uh, videos we've done here, is that Abraham was given a promise in Genesis 12 that he was going to, uh, that out of, out of his family was going to come a great nation who lived in a land and blessed the world by the way in which they lived in that land. And so what you have in the, uh, in the success of books after Genesis, you have, first of all, you might say that people of God live in a family mode. They're just basically a family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob's family. When you get to Exodus, you see that they actually have now become a full nation, but they're now just a slave nation. And in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers, you still see the children of Israel as a great nation, but they don't have a land yet. Uh, when finally in the book of Joshua, they come into the land. And therefore, you finally have uh, a major fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. Finally, God is giving them the land, and therefore God is fulfilling his promise to Abraham. Another theme of the book of uh, Joshua is God is over nature. I, uh, you'll see early on in the book of Joshua, there's the, uh, the miraculous walking into the promised land over the Jordan, and God actually uh, ma gives the Jordan, basically uh, does the very same thing he did with the Red Sea. What he does is a miracle in which the waters of the Jordan are stopped up so that people can go over on dry land. And there's another place in the book which is pretty famous where it's supposedly the sun stood still. You have to read it in Judges chapter 10. It doesn't exactly say that, uh, but it does say that God lengthened the day so that they could um, uh, continue their battle. And so we see in the book of Joshua the kind of uh, way in which God showed that he was the Lord of all nature. He's not just a, a, a tribal deity, but he's the omnipotent Lord of the whole world. The way he showed himself to be that in the book of Exodus, he does that again in the book of, uh, in the book of Joshua. But one other thing about Joshua is not only did the children of Israel come in for the first time now into the promised land, and not only do they um, have God who is now fighting for them, to, in order to give them the land, but they also find that God is a holy God. 
a very holy God. Uh, and there's a lot of things in the book of Joshua that trouble a lot of people. Uh, one of them is there's a, there are places where he says that this entire city, the people are wicked and they, they are devoted to destruction. And in other words, the holiness of God demands that they all be destroyed, man, women, children, everything, race of the ground. That bothers us for God to say, because of my holiness, um, this, this entire um, uh, city must be destroyed. But what's interesting is the holiness of God is not racially, uh, it doesn't racially favor the Jews. Because when Achan violates the holiness of God, in Joshua chapter 7, when Achan is told not to take any of the plunder but to give it all to God, he takes the plunder and then, of course, God, uh, is, he's discovered and when he's discovered, he's, uh, he's destroyed, he's executed along with his entire family. And what that shows is there's something about God's holiness which, uh, which bothers us yet, and yet it's absolutely just and fair. It's not really like he's saying, well, you know, my holiness is on the side of the Jews and I'm just af after the Gentiles. No, no, the holiness is not on the side of anybody but God himself. So we actually see a, a side to God, a holiness that we haven't really maybe seen since the book of Leviticus in the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, by the way, breaks down into two parts. Uh, 1 to 12 is where they actually come in and they uh, take the land. And then chapter uh, 13 to the end is where how they allocate the land to the various tribes. And so in that sense, it's rather straightforward. How does it help the biblical story move along? As I said, this actually is the next chapter in the story. Uh, the real question is, will the children of Israel now, that they not only are a nation, but they have the land, will they now be a witness to the, to the nations? And so in Joshua, you actually see the moving from being, you know, like I said, they were a family in Genesis, then they became a nation in Exodus and Numbers, Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and now they're in the land. Now they are an actual nation with a land, with a culture, with a society. Will they be able to establish a society that um, uh, bears witness to God? And uh, if you read the book of Joshua, you'll actually see it's fairly optimistic. Judges will be different. <laughs> It's fairly optimistic. And even at the very end of his life, at the end of the book of Joshua, which is uh, chapters uh, you know, 23 and 24, yeah, where Joshua gives his final exhortation, there's still a lot of hope on everybody's part that we're going to move from being a nation into having the land and then now being a witness. But of course, as we're going to see in the book of Judges, that's not what happens. Uh, where are their principles of grace and where is it point to Jesus? Let's say briefly this. One of the most interesting characters in the book of Joshua is Rahab. Do you know Rahab, who is a prostitute, who um, took care of the spies in Jericho, and then she and her family were uh, saved, even though Jericho was destroyed. Rahab is mentioned more often in the New Testament than even Joshua is. And the book of Hebrews talks about the fact that Rahab, though she was a prostitute, she showed faith. She was saved by faith, not by works. She was a prostitute. And that just shows that you're saved by grace and by faith, not by your good works or your pedigree. And one of the most fascinating things about Rahab is that she's actually in Jesus' genealogy. If you read the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, you'll see that, believe it or not, Rahab was one of his mothers, one of his foremothers. And that shows that it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It doesn't matter whether you're a prostitute. It doesn't matter whether you're a hit man for the mob. You believe in Jesus Christ. You're in his family. You're in his family. Um, Jesus is the ultimate rest giver. You know, Joshua was trying to bring the people rest by giving them a land. Well, Jesus is the ultimate rest giver, as we know, Hebrews chapter 3. But one other interesting thing is, whereas Joshua gave the children of Israel a land through some pretty vicious fighting, a lot of violence. Jesus Christ gives us a new heavens and new earth, a perfect land, through taking that violence on himself. And that's the last thing I need to say. The book of Joshua is very troubling to a lot of people because in it, God is a warrior. 
and he fights against uh, evil, but in many cases he destroys people. When Jesus Christ comes along, uh, he doesn't seem like a warrior. He actually is weak, he's actually, he goes to the cross, he's slain, but what's going on in Jesus is we are learning a new way to fight against evil. In the Old Testament, very often the way to fight against evil was literally to take up a sword and go destroy the, the, uh, the wicked. But in the New Testament, we've got a great little uh, hymn, by the way, that explains what we do as far as Romans chapter 12 is, don't repay evil for evil, but overcome evil with good, not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, but with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. Jesus Christ has taught us the way to overcome evil, the way to fight against evil, the way to war against evil is by love and forgiveness and kindness and mercy. And Jesus Christ has transformed divine warfare. And we're kind of glad when you take a look at the book of Joshua, you say, uh, I understand that people are wicked. I understand God is holy. I understand these people didn't get anything they didn't deserve. But thank you, O Lord Jesus Christ of the New Testament. You are the true warrior and you've shown us the true warfare, which is not a violent one at all, but one of forgiveness and compassion and love. So there's the book of Joshua and how it points us to the gospel of grace and to Jesus himself.